No, Mark, thank you so much for agreeing um, to be on the show. Um, I think we have quite a lot of interesting things to discuss uh, based on this very awesome uh, uh, book, which is edited by yourself. Um, and what I actually wanted to start with is your own story in your own words. So I'm going to do this quite often where I, where I quote things from the book. Um, so in your, in your opening essay, <clears throat> you say, what is a man who can define true manhood? When, if ever, did we become men in the U.S.? Where, if anywhere, can I go to learn about masculinity? Why should I accept my father's views on gender expression? And I found that to be quite powerful and wanted to, at least for our viewers, use that to sort of introduce you and let us know the journey that led you to these very critical questions and how the journey has been so far in, in getting those answers. Yeah, it's it's been a 63 year journey. <laughs> I'm 63, man. I'm on August 6, 1960. I still got a baby face. Like right. I said yesterday, yeah, black don't, don't crack. Yeah, don't crack. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So it, it's been a 63-year journey to get to this moment to be with you in South Africa. So I'm definitely honored and humbled to be here with you. Um, you know, the question of manhood for Black Americans in this country is it's still a question that I don't think one person can answer for everybody. Like, I, I can't speak for all Black men. I can only share my experience. And, you know, I, I had my father growing up. I had a grandfather. I had my three brothers. Um, but there seemed to be a disconnect, you know, in terms of sharing our lived experiences. And I never felt safe. I never felt appreciated. I always felt different and isolated. Um, and that really disturbed my spirit for a long time. I never really felt like I can go to my father for guidance and direction. He wasn't home. He was working, yeah. you know, uh, he was, if he wasn't working, he was at the casino. Uh, you know, he was abusive towards my mother. He had other women. You know, I had a very, um, you know, difficult uh, relationship with my father as, as a kid. And so I, I never really learned to, to, to respect or trust him. And so I kept all those feelings on the inside. You know, so I, I didn't really understand about manhood. You know, the message that I got was being a man is, is what you can buy, you know, and what you can sell, what you have, a house, a car, women, alcohol, you know, external stuff. Um, but, you know, it's interesting. I, I was reading something um, a couple of days ago. Uh, Indigenous People's Day is October the 9th. And um, somebody sent me some information. I wrote it down. It, it talks about masculinity. And the Indigenous people, they, they see masculinity as um, humility, mm. especially humility, respect for the earth unity towards all human beings and a shared sense of community responsibility. Our men are seen as protectors, storytellers, and wisdom bearers. But in my country, you know, a man is a basketball player, a rapper, uh, he's got several women, he drinks, he smokes weed. And I know that sounds really negative and I don't want to paint a broad brush because there's a lot of beautiful, brilliant, black men in this country who are, um, you know, doing the right thing. They're taking care of their families. They're, you know, they have healthy relationships. They're loving fathers. But those images are not, <clears throat> not always available to us, you know? <laughs> so it's, it's really difficult. Um, <clears throat> I, I want to read something, um, a quote by a Professor uh, Leonard Jeffries. And he talks about images. I hope I can find it, because I thought you might ask me this question. Here it is. It says, whoever controls the images controls your self-esteem, self-respect, and self-development. Whoever controls the history controls the vision. And so my history as a man has always been compromised. You know, I, I self-identify as same gender loving. You know, I'm attracted to men. Um, and so that was a source of shame for a long time, mm -hmm. you know, um, I'm HIV positive, 
So I was diagnosed over 29 years ago. I I, I felt dirty and shameful and un, un, undesirable. Okay. Um, I also live with mental illness, anxiety, and depression. You know, I've I've struggled with suicide ideation. You know, so my sense of manhood is is it's a journey. Right. It's a 63 year journey. Right. I, I I love myself today. You know, I feel good about myself today. I embrace my manhood. Right. But I think masculinity as a term does not serve black people. And I think we should get rid of it. That was a long answer. <laughs> Sorry. No, no, no. It's, 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 uh, I don't think there would ever be a, a, a very simple answer to this, right? And the one thing I'm thinking is the fact that one, I don't think. Uh, as black men, there's any journey of masculinity that anyone can share that's an easy one, uh, one that's uh, not without the nuance of the different um, challenges and the social constructs that we are brought up in, right? That would have almost what I call this predefined template of the type of human beings we should be. Um, so when you're reading that um, indigenous quote, the type of human being that's described there uh, is like foreign to what we would attach to a typical template of what uh, a black man should be. Um, and I think it's it's a problem or a challenge that not just men um, there in America face. I think it's definitely the same um, here. Um, and there's some of that that I wanted to get into. Um, uh, and I will get there with this following uh, quote from the book. Uh, so for those who, who don't know, uh, I haven't mentioned yet. So uh, it's honestly a collection of essays written by uh, black men talking uh, mental health. And I think what really stands out for me, and as we get into the different experts, I want to uh, chat with Mark, is the the stories and the struggles and the things black men sit with right i don't think there's been um in the last 60 70 years a concerted effort to unearth all of this trauma that we sit with right and it shows up in the ways that we shame ourselves right because we don't fit into a hyper masculine mold in one way or another maybe you're not uh, strong enough maybe you're not attracted to girls maybe you're not the the football player <laughs> whatever the case may be and because we've bought into this template right we then as human beings shame ourselves for the fact that how come i don't fit into that and i'm less of a man if i if i don't so the 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 essay is called despondence uh, by David Malabranch. I hope I pronounced his surname correctly. And the passage I wanted to read, he says, I miss the black man I once was. Grief changed him. The man sitting in his place is broken and bruised like an aged prize fighter at the end of a heavyweight bout. His eyes are swollen, shut and delirious with blood and crusted debris. It's hard to imagine it gets better when I can't conceptualize when or how it will. And I wanted to use that passage to to get your thoughts about what would your assessment be in the 63-year journey that you've been on about how we're trying to make progress to redefine masculinity from a place of unbrokenness, right? Because if the starting point of how we've maybe defined our masculinity is from a place of brokenness for whichever reasons, it, it, then I think pain begets pain. So that's that's my my question in terms of your observations and us redefining. Okay, could you could you um, state your question again, please? What would your assessment be uh, on our collective effort as black men to try and redefine masculinity from a lens that's not broken, right? Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, I think that's what you and I are attempting to do by having this conversation. Uh, yeah. Because you're in South Africa, I'm in New York City. We've never met. Uh, we're meeting through cyberspace. We're in technology. Yeah. So we don't have a physical presence, but there's a spiritual connection. Um, and there's a level of respect. And yeah. 
I have I have no reason to be dishonest with you. I'm not fearful of you. I don't feel threatened by you. Um, and so just learning how to be present yeah. in my relationships is a good place to start, is to tell you the truth about yeah. who I am and how I see myself and not be concerned about your emotional reaction yeah. to my present reality. You know, that was always my challenge. I was always afraid if I told you the truth, you wasn't going to like me. And so I never had a sense of integrity or intimacy because I was so consumed by fear. But but today I can talk to you man to man and, and just speak my truth and, and be okay with that, you know, and not be concerned that you're going to go tell your homie, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Are you going to go gossip about me or whatever? Like, I, I don't have those yeah. concerns because... Yeah. I'm comfortable in my own skin today. And I think, you know, over the last decade or so, more and more black men across the diaspora are having conversations of, around manhood, around mental health, around masculinity, and they're becoming more transparent and more vulnerable and more open. And they're taking off that mask. You know, Paul Lawrence Dunbar says, we wear the mask that our lives, you know, the highs and highs and shades mm -hmm. our eyes, you know. So we don't always have to wear a mask. When I walk into a room, I can just talk to Lens and ask you how you're feeling today and not judge you for how you're feeling or shame you for how you're feeling, but just accept the energy that you're giving to me and embrace you, give you a hug instead of a joint. <laughs> I don't smoke weed, so. <laughs> you know, instead of time, time to get you to come to the bar, right, and, and, and narcotize your energy, just let's talk. Yeah. You talk, yeah. I listen. Manhood, part of manhood is just being present for each other when we feel safe to trust the energy that we share. Okay, okay. Um, one of the things I think that's uh, a very strong factor for a lot of black men is this pressure to be able to show up and and be the provider, right? Um and almost your place in society or the level of respect given to you versus your net worth, um, uh, never mind your self-worth, just your net worth <laughs> is what matters. Uh, it becomes, I think, uh, uh, a very difficult um, challenge and struggle for, for men, particularly in a context where they probably are working in a system that has been orchestrated and designed against them historically so, right? Um, and on this, um, T. Hassan Johnson in the book says, um, recognizing a man beyond his utility reaffirms his humanity, as does acknowledging the limitations of our cultural training in regards to black male roles in our cultural milieu. And my question to you would be, do you believe we're getting to a, 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 a consciousness where black men are being seen for who they are and are not being evaluated against the lens of what society thinks they should be? Well, I believe that we are. I believe that we are on the journey. Okay. Um, according to Dr. John Henry Clark, uh, who's transition. He's a historian, Pan-Africanist. He said that African people have been in America since 1442. So we have almost 600 years of unlearning and relearning to do about our humanity. And yeah. you and I can reclaim our humanity right now. So that, you know, the journey continues, mm -hmm. you know, pain shared is pain less than. Um, so there's a lot of rethinking that we have to do. For example, there's this idea that patriarchy and privilege benefits all men. And that's a false argument. You know, historically in this country, patriarchy was used to define genealogy and generation. So LeBron James, for example, is a wealthy black American male. But unlike George Bush or John Kennedy or Donald Trump, LeBron James did not inherit unearned money in his family. Oprah Winfrey is a wealthy black American female, but unlike Jacqueline Kennedy and Paris Hilton and Jessica Pagula, she did not inherit unearned uh, money. So black Americans do not 
experience patriarchy because there's no generational wealth collectively. There's a few of us who got some money, right? But collectively, we do not have generational wealth. We don't transit from generation to generation. So there's no pay patriarchy was never intended to benefit me and you. But because we're getting information from feminists, intersectionality people, reporters, journalists, scholars, most of them women, they believe that patriarchy comes with gender and genitals. That's not true, right? Mm -hmm. I used to be homeless, jobless, and penniless, right? I, I'm, I'm in recovery. I've been clean 28 years and, and counting. There was a point in my life when I was homeless, jobless, penniless, and I was smoking crack, right? I did not have patriarchy and privilege at, at that time. So there's a, that's, a, that's a narrative that we have to change. There's no black men across the diaspora do not have patriarchy and we don't have privilege. We think it's gender and genitals, but it's not. So we have to change that. We have to, we have to share from a place of self-determination and we have to speak from our own minds, from our own spirit, from our own history in our own words. Love that. When they always write the narrative for us. I think on this one, um, more specifically now moving into into mental health, um, and the reason for you putting these stories together. Again, I want to quote from an essay in the book. It's called "My Story" by Charles Crouch. Um, says something very insightful. It goes, living with depression is one thing. Being a black man with clinically diagnosed depression is a completely different monster. I've often said the majority, if not all black men suffer from some sort of societal post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD. We deal with triggers and anxiety, which non-black and brown people rarely experience. Um, and then the last thing I wanted to uh, read was it says black men are surrounded by people who may call them weak or people who constantly tell them to man up. The beliefs are even worse when that person is your spouse. You have to have someone who understands the disease of depression and not someone who just sees the visual representation of depression. The visual alone can be very deceiving. And my question would be, um, Com common narrative throughout all of these beautiful essays is there's something that speaks to isolation and being alone and not being supported and seen. And for other black men who are watching this, um, and maybe they are, are for the first time realizing the extent of which other brothers are suffering in silence. My question would be how, in your opinion, do we try and show up as brothers, uh, for each other, particularly when it comes to mental health um, uh, challenges? Well, um, one of the ways that we show for each other is just by having these conversations where people feel safe to speak their truth, where they don't feel like they're gonna be harmed or judged or ridiculed or emasculated, et cetera. Um, it's, it's really hard to be what you can't see. So we need someone who can model how to express themselves in a way without losing their dignity and their self-respect. Um, and, and I agree with Charles in terms of the post-traumatic slavery disorder. Um, every black man goes through it, not just in the United States, but all over the world, where we see the dominant culture who treats us as less than human. You know, it's, it's in the law, the laws of New York State. I live in New York City. The laws of New York State are based on apartheid, right? Nobody wants to talk about that. So that's why I'm not on BET or CNN. <laughs> <laughs> Very unpopular topic to have on those shows. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they don't they don't want me on those shows because I I'm I'm gonna tell it like it is, you know what I'm saying? So <laughs> so yeah, I mean, you know, there's depression and there is clinical depression, and it's important to discern the, the difference. I mean, there's seasonal depression, like I have moderate depression, but it was a clinical diagnosis. So when my, my father transitioned, that depression was different from being depressed mm -hmm. when I lost my job. And it's important for me to make that distinction for myself, not for you or for my friends, but for myself. So I can be free to speak my mind. And we need to have more spaces where we can just 
tell the truth. And those spaces are becoming more and more prevalent. There's more and more podcasts. There's a lot of barbershop talks going around. There's support groups. There's um, conferences. We just had a, a last week a mental health expo in New York City, you know, um, sponsored by Charlemagne the God and the Mental Wealth Alliance. Um, there's something going on this weekend. So we're getting together in spaces and we're, we're speaking our minds. We're telling our truth. Um, and we're not getting the same type of pushback that you get on social media. So if I go on Instagram and tell you how I feel, there's probably going to be about 100 people who disagree with me. And, you know, you're going to kind of go back and forth. You don't really get any progress. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, I think on that, the, um, one of the things I wanted to ask related to, to, to the battle that men face uh, on, on mental health is how are you seeing things opening up from an access standpoint and when i say access access to a mental health protection uh, practitioner that first of all looks like you <laughs> so probably has greater context in what it feels like to live in your skin and in your struggles um which already i think creates a level of trust and empathy uh, that is more likely to 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 get people to open up. So what, what's your observations on, on that? That access? is a constant challenge. Uh, from what I understand, like 4% of psychiatrists in the United States are, are, are black, which is very low. Um, you know, there are more female black therapists than black male therapists. My first therapist was a, was a woman from Bosnia. You know, she was younger than me. Um, and I've had, I have had black male therapists. Um, there are more who are emerging, but there's still a void a black male therapist in this country. Um, and so that's, that, that's a challenge. And, and also, let me just say that therapy is not a one size fits all solution. True. And sometimes in our own community, we tend to blame and shame men who decide that they don't want to engage in therapy. It should not be a litmus test, right? If a man says, I don't want to go to therapy, it doesn't mean he's in denial. He doesn't want to help. He doesn't want to talk to anybody, right? It should, therapy is not aspirin. You know what I'm saying? You go in the emergency room, they give everybody the same thing, and that's not how therapy works. It worked for me, but it's not for everybody. And we do need more black male therapists who are not just black and male, but also who are um who are present, who are culturally competent, right? Um, because not every black man, like Malcolm X said, all kin folk ain't skin folk. You know what I'm saying? So like we need more than just the color the, and the gender, because color and culture are not the same thing. True. I've had black male therapists who, who who did not serve me well, and I had to move on because they were trying to change me to fit their model of what a person, what a client should be. And I was like, no, you, you can't tell me how to behave. So it, it's a challenge. It's a challenge. But but you know there are there are more and more black male therapists who are showing up and and being available. I'd like to read another excerpt uh, called How It Works uh, from Tim West's essay. He says, rather than trying to make sense of suicide, we could all do better to create a world where triggers fail, where hope is bountiful on the edge of despair and where it's okay for people to not be okay. People who are suicidal don't need to be fixed. We need our pain affirmed. Life sucks. This hurts. It's unfair. Why? Because sometimes it just is. Against the tide of dismissive, tomorrow will be better. Just get over it or it gets better. We might humbly own we can't understand what we can't understand. The better question might be, what do you need to be okay? And being prepared to ask, what else? Um, and so... My question to you is, in the stories you've been exposed to, do you find there's maybe a certain set of common traits in the men um, who have gotten to the point where they're able to be okay enough to be vulnerable enough to say, I'm not okay, <laughs> right? Because for me, that's the key, you know, to unlock the door of, of, of men truly opening up. So yeah, that's my question in terms of common traits, if you think there are any. There are common traits amongst the 30 contributors. Uh, Tim West is one of a few men who admitted 
to multiple attempts to die by suicide. And I say yeah. die by suicide, not commit suicide. Because when we say someone tried to commit suicide, we are implying the person who tried to end their life is somehow a criminal or is somehow selfish, is somehow unethical, or somehow less than a human being. So, so language matters. It's important that we have compassion yeah. and empathy for people who try to end their life. Um, suicide is the third leading cause of death amongst black men, ages 25 to 34. And black men die by suicide at a rate of three times more than, than black women. And so it's important yeah. that we are mindful of how we language people like Timmerman because he has his own views about why he decided to take his life more than once. Uh, almost every contributor talked about anxiety and depression. Yes. Uh, but there wasn't the same level of visceral vulnerability which which every person. And that's okay. That's okay. Not everybody has that sense of integrity where they can say what you just said, I'm not okay. Because to say I'm not okay can make you feel like less than a man. And mm -hmm. do I have the humility to admit I feel less than a man in this moment? A lot of us don't. So we go to work, we go to school, we go to church, we take care of our family, but we can't tell anybody I feel inferior. I feel inadequate. I feel incomplete. I feel unhappy, right? We don't know how to say it. I feel hurt. You hurt my feelings. I feel wounded. That's not the normal way that Black men express themselves. And so you do find some men in the book who have that level and some who don't, you know, but collectively, I find that all 30 of those men share something in common that was really beautiful and really powerful and resonates with the men and women who've been buying the book in the last seven months. And with that being said, um, those 30 men and maybe uh, in the work that you've, you've been doing, the more than the 30 you've interacted with, two questions. Um, what scares you the most about the state of black masculinity? And then the opposite positive question, what gives you the most hope? Um, about the state of black masculinity? What scares me the most is the idea that one person can speak for all black men, mm. right? Like Malcolm X, for example. You know, he's mm. our shining prince. He's gone, but there was this idea that Malcolm X by himself had the prescription for our illness. And that's really not real. That's not mm -hmm. fair. Nobody yeah. can speak for everybody. So that that's 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 a concern when we have these conferences and you ask four men to get on a panel and one person has the mic and they have the power of the mic and everybody claps because what they said resonated, but they can't speak for everybody. So sometimes it takes a man to say, I can't speak for everybody because I don't know everybody and I haven't lived your experience. I have my own lived experience. I know what suicide ideation is about. <clears throat> And I'm here to tell my story, but I, I can't share the people who are gone. There are people in the grave right now who decided to take their life, you know? Um, and, and the hope, again, it comes back to you and I. You know, you're in South Africa, I'm in New York. We've never met, but we're having this conversation. This probably would not have happened 10 years ago. You know, yeah. 10 years ago, there were not a lot of podcasts where Black men were talking about manhood, mental health, suicide, depression. It just was not part of our ecosystem. But now it's becoming, I wouldn't say the norm, but there's more and more of us who are finding the courage and the humility to speak out, you know, about what disturbs us. Because ultimately, I think we want to be at peace, right? Yeah. We want to be at peace. We want to heal. We want to grow. We want to evolve. We want to mature. We want to be liberated. But like you said, we have to first admit, I'm not okay right now. I'm hurting I'm wounded, I'm sad, I'm frustrated. I can't tell you I feel some type of way and get some help, because that's not a feeling. But that's what we say. Oh, I'm good, I'm all right, I'm chilling. No, I'm not, <laughs> but that's how we talk. <laughs> yeah. That's how we talk. Yeah. We gotta change the way we talk, man. So, yeah. yeah. No, I mean, I think you're, I think a lot of what you described is is 100 true here so the so even some of the stats um so south africa 
has amongst the highest suicide rates in the world amongst men, uh, similar to the to the US, where it's at least three times the rate at which women. Um, 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 yeah, and and it's all for me the fact that there's so much that we carry in us that we are not taught how to vocalize, right? Because uh, and a lot of you, right, um, the stories in this book also speak to that being brought up in this context of, you know, st stop being a little girl, uh, men don't cry, uh, and all of this kind of stuff. And we are then become very dishonest with ourselves because we don't want to admit that, actually, I am feeling some type of way, <laughs> you know? This situation at my job got me some kind of fucked up, you know? <laughs> we... Um, and, and because there's this, uh, I think, um, it maybe touches on how those difficulties then have also been messaged to us in a way that men are also victims of patriarchy because it's only the patriarchy, right? And it's expectations of who you're supposed to be in the world, uh, you know, puts these expectations on you. But to the point that you made earlier, if I'm not even in the power position, <laughs> right? And still trying to fight in a system to be recognized. I don't know what is this privilege that you speak of. <laughs> and that's not always true, right? And maybe another statistic is, you know, South Africa is at the point where we we are hitting about 40% unemployment rate um, and 60% of our youth are unemployed. Um, that largely affects a lot and a lot of young black men, right? So you tie that with how you're perceived in society um, by virtue of your net worth. And already at a young age, you're made to feel like you're not mad enough because, dude, you don't got no job. <laughs> you know, um, social media expectations is that if you're the man, then you need to have, you know, this year. So a lot of how then men perceive themselves and see them worthy of respect and dignity in society is still so tied to all these ideas that we need to uh, dismantle. Um, and on that, I think one of the things I wanted to read was uh, Jason. Um, Jason Rosario really speaks um, to a lot of this. Um, it says, machismo in Latino culture allows for an all-out assault on the emotional, gender, and sexual expressions of men. If one displays too much emotion, he must be a pendejo, e.g. punk. If he exhibits a good neck with the ladies, queer bacano, uh, my Spanish is bad, the man. If the opposite is true, he is labeled uh, maricon. To survive, we are forced to adapt and conform or risk acceptance by our peers and families. And my question to you, Mark, would be, how much longer do we expect men to hide who they truly are because they can only be accepted by molding into different things of whom they truly not? How long? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and it's also a challenge to me and you because it's like, uh, okay, dude, we're going to, in one generation, it's going to be done. We are the, <laughs> you know, it's a, uh, yeah, because I, I, I think it's, it's, it's a, it's, it's, it's a very, uh, yeah, very pertinent um, dismantling work that needs to be, needs to be done. And unfortunate consequence of it is that not everyone is going to benefit from that dismantling right away. And yeah. Uh, my asking that question is sort of unfair, I know, because uh, you <laughs> you don't have a, <laughs> uh, uh, you're not a, you've not claimed to be a prophet. Uh, if you had, I'd probably be asking you for a lot more numbers instead. <laughs> no, no, but I, I, I appreciate, you know, your inquiry. I mean, I believe that anything constructed should be, can be deconstructed. Like the term masculinity can be deconstructed because I don't think it benefits us as a collective, that's just my personal opinion. And I also don't yeah. think that our journey is going to lead us to the mountaintop, like Dr. King said, you know, uh, I may not get there with you, but, you know, so I, that was his religious fervor, 
which we all don't share. You know, I have an eclectic approach yeah. to spirituality, but I'm not a Buddhist or Catholic or Muslim, or yeah. et cetera. I, I respect people's beliefs, but I don't believe that black men or men of African descent are climbing the mountain to get to the top and they're going to have a flag and say, now nah, I'm a man. Like I, <laughs> I don't think that that's our journey. Right. Right. We all have our own individual journey and it's not supposed to look the same for everybody. Mm. You know, I'm 63. You're not. <laughs> I don't know how your life's going to be when you get 63, but I don't know. I'm not trying to model what a 63 year old black man should be. I'm just trying to be, I'm just, I'm just want to be Mark. I don't want to be like Mike. I want to be like Mark. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. I'm okay. Not being okay. And I'm okay yeah. being okay. And every moment yeah. is different. You know, so it, it's it's a journey, uh, Lens. You know, manhood is a journey. Life is a journey. Spirituality is a journey. And, you know, we're going to walk. We're going to run. We're going to hide. We're going to scream. We're going to cry. We're going to shout. It, it's all part of the journey. And then we get some rest. And then we do it all over again for 24 hours. Yeah. No, I, 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 couldn't, I couldn't agree more. And I think one of the things as you were talking that I was reflecting on is that you know the fact that we're in a in a moment in history where these kinds of conversations are largely becoming the norm is at least already an indication that things are going in the hopefully going in the right direction um and then is each man unearths his own truth for himself in terms of who he wants to be in the world and we create a world where that's accepted then then we're on we're on good standing now, on that, one of the things I was And also, let me just say, too, Lynn, oh. let me just say is also, every Black man, in my opinion, should not have the same beliefs and morals and values, right? Marriage is not for everyone. Children are not for everyone. Everyone doesn't want to graduate from college. Everyone mm -hmm. does not want to buy a house or a car or land. Everyone does not want to travel, right? And, and that's okay. And we should not shame people for their choices. You know what I'm saying? We should not. And, and sometimes I think as black men, that's what we do. We, we shame people because of what they're not doing. Because we think individually, well, you should be like me. You know, you should have your own Instagram page. You should have money in, in the savings account. You know, you should only have one woman. You know what I'm saying? Or whatever. I'm just, we just have these preconceived yeah, yeah. ideas they're not for every, you can't speak for all black, I don't care who you are. You can't speak for all black men. And that's something I'm not trying to do. You know what I'm saying? We don't have the same yeah. values, but we do have a history. Yeah, and we do yeah, have a yeah. history that has served us well. And we can look to people, you know, for guidance, for direction, for wisdom, right? And we can look to people like, you know, Patrice Lumumba and Shea Guevara and W.E.B. Du Bois, and Nat Turner, and Crispus Attucks, and, you know, Malcolm X, and Dr. King, and so forth and so on. You know, we all have our own heroes. So I just think, you know, it's important that we find out who we are and just be who we are every day. It's, it's interesting you mentioned that because I was having a chat with a uh, uh, friend. So he grew up... Um, with a wide range of interests. So uh musician, so he plays drums, now he's into cycling and all this kind of stuff. And we're talking about the fact that the idea that as a black boy he could even conceive that who he wanted to be was such an uphill struggle. <laughs> right? Because there's almost like this very sort of what you what you mean you piano? <laughs> you want to play piano? What? what? <laughs> you know, and and I'm thinking one of the things I appreciate about uh, you know, the the book that you put together is when you when you read the bios of all of the people who've contributed, it's almost this kaleidoscope of role models of the different ways black men can actually be who they are. Right. It's not this the examples you mentioned earlier. I think if you think black American successful man, the first images that come up in people's minds is basketball players, rappers, you know, almost these very, for lack of a better word, you know, typical uh, um, 
sort of um, stereotypes, for lack of a better word. Um, and for as long as we also then can help other black boys see that you can also be in that same category as as a chef, as a dancer, <laughs> as whatever it is, right? Then it, it it helps a lot more because I think what we, part of the, the problem to the point that you're mentioning is because we've been stereotyped and put in these boxes, then of course, uh, there's only three types of black men. So even if we have Mark on the show, then he can speak for all of them because there can only be three <laughs> prototypes of them that exist. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, growing up, when I would look, read a newspaper, typically I would see black men in the same two spaces, on the front page, on the back page. On the front page, he was a criminal. On the back page, he was an athlete. And so there was no balance no harmony, no unity. And this was all part of white supremacy. This is patriarchy. This is power. This is privilege, right? This is how racism shows up, is that we only see ourselves as a criminal or an athlete. And depending upon where you live, that may be what you see too, is people who are selling drugs and, and, and shooting hoops. You may not right. see people who want to be a dancer or a sculptor or a biochemist right? When I was in fourth mm -hmm. grade, I won a science contest and people said I wanted to be white because I speak wow. well. I'm articulate. I'm eloquent. Like I'm the only person. You know what I mean? Like <laughs> white people think that they're complimenting you when they say, oh, you're so articulate. Like I'm not supposed to be. You know what I mean? <laughs> right? We all get that. All over the world we get, oh, you're so eloquent. You're so intelligent. You're not like the other ones. That's what they really want to say. You're the good they black. You're the good black. <laughs> right, right. You're the good black person, right? You Because you know your place. You know what I'm saying? So I don't believe in equality in the sense of I want to be equal to white people. Because I, white people have Aren't not you? modeled the standard of, of humanity that I want to aspire to. But in this country, that's what we think. Equality. Equality. Now you got this thing about DEI. Diversity, equality, inclusion. Diversity, in my opinion, is one less job for a white person. Mm. That's not progress. You know what I'm saying? When you have one black person on staff, that's not diversity. All the NFL owners are whites. Okay? So what? You got 15 black quarterbacks. All the owners are whites. Mm -hmm. They have the power. That has to change. But that's yeah. not our immediate priority. On um, things changing, one of the things I was interested in is... Um, and we touched a bit of it on it um, about what are some of the, when it comes to mental health, what are some of the issues that black men face? And in the essay, Mental Health Issues Among Black Men by Jeff, um, his essay looks at the complications due to COVID-19 and how it affected the mental health of black men. And there's a very interesting paragraph where he says, um, many black men refrain from pursuing professional help due to various reasons. These barriers include finding therapists who are knowledgeable about black culture, false representations or negative generation generalizations of therapy, fear of being judged and being misdiagnosed. Um, and then later under the discussion around black men's attitudes towards mental health. He says, unlike in the past where African-Americans view dialogue regarding mental health as an embarrassment, black families are openly discussing psychological well-being issues. Black people need to continue these conversations among each other to promote mental health aware awareness. Um, and my question or discussion with you on this one is, um, you know, what do you think has been some of the key I don't know, for lack of a better word, successes in us as Black people being able to have mental health uh, discussions. I tell you why. When I was growing up, the only vocabulary that existed for any kind of mental health uh, in the township and stuff was Uyaslani, which basically literally means this person's crazy, right? Um, <laughs> so... Here, it's been quite the journey to even get our parents' generation or the generation before to even accept things like your 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 depression, anxiety as things that people actually live with. Um, and so in that progress, I would like to ask how, how strongly seated do you think our mental health struggles sit within the cultural 
pretenses we need to keep up because as black men, you're supposed to be strong. You're supposed to be the provider. You're supposed to be this. You're not even supposed to feel fear <laughs> or anything like that. Um, um, so in us healing ourselves, does it really mean letting a sense of these cultural expectations um, of ourselves go? Um, and if so, does that mean part of redefining masculinity is redefining ourselves entirely? I know I asked a lot. <laughs> that was a lot. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but it's part of your tumor. Yeah. <laughs> when I was a kid, I would go to school. Uh, we would get out at 3 o'clock. But there was one class when they would get out at 2.30. And they would get out because they were all isolated. And they yeah. were called crazy, retarded, and slow. And they would all get into a little yellow school bus. And we were supposed to avoid these kids because apparently we had nothing in common with them. They were somehow different from us. And so we grew up with that sense of anxiety, fear, uncertainty yeah. around mental health because they did have mental health issues, but that in the seventies, the word mental health was not a part of our social consciousness. So again, we use words like crazy, retarded and slow, but now, you know, we can talk about anxiety, depression, isolation, PTSD, stress, trauma, um, suicide ideation, paranoid schizophrenia, in ways in which it doesn't feel so heavy because it's our personal reality, it's our collective reality. And, and we can convene together and have these conversations and have these forums and have these workshops and have these conferences. Um, but it does speak to how we have been perceived, not just in our families, but by the larger society. Because there's still a part of us, there's a self-loathing and there, there's some of us still have that little white man in the head. You know, we want to be accepted. We want to be socially acceptable. So when we go to work, we go to school, we don't talk about racism, even though it affects us every day we go to work, we go to school, especially with our coworkers and classmates, black people, some of us, we don't talk about it. So we go to the bar, we go to the gym, we go to church, whatever, but we never talk about that disturbing, destructive energy because we still don't feel affirmed culturally. We haven't mm. learned about self-determination, right? So we have to learn how to speak for ourselves, name ourselves, create for ourselves, right? And we have to do that, not just in the, not just me or you, but as a collective, you know? And it helps to have parents who model that behavior or maybe a grandfather or aunt. If that doesn't happen in the family, you kind of let to the streets where you become like a, a wolf. You know, you can't be raised by the streets in a loving and kind way, in my opinion. So we need mentors, right? I've been a mentor to a young black male for 21 years, and I've seen his life take off. And he's a wonderful human being, right? But when I met him, his, his life was a mess, just like mine was, you know? But we need, like, I went to the Million Man March, um, October 16, 1995, and we were taught about voter registration, entrepreneurship, and mentorship joining a community-based organization, which I have done, and being of service, selflessly, anonymously, right? I don't want to be rich and famous. I want to be of service to my community, right? I wrote the book to break the cycle of generational trauma in my family. Because in my yeah. family, we don't talk about how we feel. We talk about the weather. We talk about food. We talk about the game. We don't even talk about racism. And we all experience it. So there's still that cultural silence that still permeates our relationships with each other. And that has to change, in my opinion. We have to find a way to, to talk about what we deal with every day. We all have that person in our neighborhood who's nosy as fuck, right? Yeah. Always, yeah. come on, man, you know what I'm saying? And somebody gotta yeah. say something. <laughs> somebody gotta yeah. say something. We all have yeah. a thief at work. Right? Yeah. Somebody at work yeah. who steals toilet paper and pens and typing paper. We, but we don't say nothing. And we become complicit. We become complicit in the injustice. Yeah. Someone has to be the man enough, right, to speak up and say, you know, I don't think this is fair. I don't think this is just. I don't think this is humane. Let's do something else. Yeah. I think um 
it's it's quite clear to me um collectively we agree what old template of masculinity and way of being is definitely not working for us and it's it's so important i think um for us to call a spade a spade um for us to not only be honest with ourselves but it, with society in general because i think that's where being able to change things um uh begins and being brave enough right uh because it's basically uncharted territory and, and maybe this is part of the reason why we hold on so dearly to these templates and all of this kind of stuff uh, because human beings generally like what they know and they're very afraid of the unknown right um, you know that if you do this this and this this is likely going to be the outcome so if i show up in the world as a very hyper masculine guy i'm going to get respect i'm going to get women i'm going to you know i don't have the time and the energy to now to you know discover the unknown and i think that's the bravery it, it, it's it's going to take off of, of all of us i would like to uh close with first of all i think the title of this essay is absolutely phenomenal it says black men should only cry sometimes uh dr obari cartman um <clears throat> and i'm going to read a few excerpts from it because i think it's 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 very important it says if you read weak as feminine that's completely on you i never said that i don't think a crying man is more in touch with his feminine side i see him more aligned with his human nature my notion of the weak to strong spectrum has nothing to do with gender and everything to do with power. Um, then the other one he says here is Neil Brennan, a white male artist noted for his edgy writing on the critically acclaimed Chappelle show. In his beautifully insightful stand-up comedy special on Netflix said, I actually think black dudes appreciated how openly sad I was because black dudes aren't allowed to be openly sad in public. The only way a black dude can openly have sadness in public is if he does it with a saxophone. The question is definitely about expression. We know black men feel, despite their best attempts to hide it. We know black men mask sadness and fear as anger. We know black men self-medicate to not feel. And I wanted to close with that as a, an encouragement and a thank you to you for your work um, in helping us to actually feel in helping us to actually cry, in helping us to um, say we're not okay. Um, because it's only through those, I would say, things that we also then start our own healing journey. Um, and sometimes people think they're absolutely fine and maybe you need to go through some brokenness to realize you're not okay. And that's when your healing journey starts. So thank you for loving us so much um, for the work that you've done uh, for us um and hoping that it it just multiplies and goes tenfold and many more men may be reached and touched you're welcome and thank you for sharing this space with me it's definitely an honor to meet you to connect with you to speak with you and you know um if we can prevent one black male from dying by suicide then our collective pain will not be in vain amen amen Thank you so much, Mark. Uh, we'll be in touch. And guys, like, share, subscribe, leave your thoughts. Um, and obviously, we'll be uh, also having a public screening where the conversation I've had with Mark will have a independent cinema. We'll get some guys together and we'll, we'll unpack. Um, and really hoping technology cooperates and we can also get Mark to join in that discussion. I'll be honored to join. Awesome. Thanks so much, Mark. Thank you, brother.